Hey guys, what's going on? Today we're going to be talking about how to learn a chess opening for the first time. So I'm going to assume that you have no knowledge of this opening that you're about to learn. How do you start? What do you do first? What's the process you follow? I'm going to show you how I would go about learning an opening. Now in a previous video, I recommended a book called Fundamental Chess Openings, which is really good for anyone under 1800. I think it's one of the best opening books you can get. So I'm going to be using that as an example as I go through this process and show you how I would use that to help me learn an opening. That being said, if you don't own that book, I'm also going to show you how you can do the same process using some free resources online. You know, if you don't want to buy the book or you don't have a book, you can still kind of follow along with this process. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's get started. All right, now real quick before we jump into the process of how to study openings, I wanna just mention one thing that's very important. If you are a complete beginner to chess, so you just started playing, you really don't know much at all, you probably don't wanna start with how to learn and study openings, okay? If And the, the test that I would like to use is if your games have more than five blunders, then you may wanna just take a second and, and think this through. So let me show you what I mean real quick. All right, so I'm going to show you a random game from two players. These guys are rated six to 700, but the rating doesn't really matter. What matters is how they're playing. So I want you to watch something. Look at this. He sacrifices his knight for a pawn, and then he's moving on the side. Look at white. Threatening checkmate doesn't see it, so black does nothing to prevent the checkmate. But white doesn't capture it, does some random move over here. Again, black doesn't see it. So both players are completely missing the fact that there's a checkmate here. Okay, again, white missed it, did something else, giving away a pawn here, he doesn't take it, sacrificing a rook for a knight, not a good thing, moving his king out here, not good, lots of blunders are happening in this game. So the point is, if your games look like this, you might want to spend a little more time studying how to make less blunders, so learning how to do a blunder check, where you check your king and all your important pieces every time you make a move. Something like that is going to help you more than, than learning how to study an opening. Okay, The point is, you have to be at least able to play through a game without making too many blunders. And so in this game, we see pretty much every other move was like a blunder. So if your games look like that, you might just want to devote most of your time to avoiding the blunders and maybe a little bit of time to, to studying openings. And now I'm going to show you a different game from two other players. These guys are around 12 to 1300. And watch how they play the game. He, they start out with a little gambit here, which is fine. But once the game gets going, what you'll notice is they're making very good moves. They're noticing threats and, and moving pieces to safety. They're making trades. He noticed that his bishop was under attack, so he traded it off. Okay, we have some things happening here, tr making some trades. Very few blunders is, is what I'm trying to point out. They're playing good moves. Here's a threat on the knight. This player noticed it and captured. Here's a threat on the queen. He noticed it and made the trade. These guys are doing well. They're not making a blunder every other move. They may have made some blunders here and there, but they're very minimal. This is the type of person who's going to benefit most from learning openings. Okay, So just wanted to, that little word of caution. If, if you're very new to chess and you're making lots and lots of blunders, you probably want to focus on that a little bit before you jump into studying openings. Okay. That being said, for everyone else, if you feel like you've you're starting to get a handle on your blunders. It doesn't mean that you don't have them, but they're, they're minimal. Uh, let's go ahead and keep moving forward with how to actually study openings. Okay, so when you're learning an opening for the first time, there's really three steps to it. At least this is how I like to think of it. Step number one is you have to decide what opening are you going to learn, All right? That's the first question that you have to know. Like if you're going to play for white, do, do you want to learn an e4 opening? Do you want to learn a d4 opening? Or do you want to learn something else? If you're going to play for black, are you going to play, you know, what are you going to play against e4? What are you going to play against d4, right? Those are questions that have to be asked. You have to choose something. You can't learn all the openings at the same time. You got to choose one and start somewhere and build off of it. So step number one is choose what opening you're going to play. And I'll talk about how to do that in just a second. Step number two is you want to learn the bare minimum basic backbone of the opening. What I mean by that is like the main core opening moves. Okay, so Sicilian defense, e4, c5. And the main line in the Sicilian defense is knight f3, d6, d4, captures, captures, knight f6, 
and knight c3. That's where I'm going to start. It's it's like, what is that, five moves? And that is the backbone. That is the core main line of the Sicilian defense, right? White attacks the center. Black tries to control it. White plays knight f3 to set up d4. They trade. Black attacks. And, you know, white does this to defend the pawn. You just start there. Okay, you just start there. And then the third step would be to build off of that and add more and more details and layers of complexity to the opening knowledge. So, for example, if we go back, d6 is the main line in the Sicilian, but sometimes people play e6, and you get you can get slightly different positions. Sometimes people play knight c6, and you can get slightly different positions. So you would maybe say, okay, what's the main couple of moves in the knight c6 line? So d4 takes, takes, and then what, what happens here? How is that different from the lines where there was d6? Or going back, um, if they play e6, okay, d4 takes, takes, what is the next move that black's going to play and how is this different? And you start to build off those basic building blocks. All right, so those are the three steps. And now let's go back and talk about the first step, choosing an opening. So what I'm going to do, and I'll put this up on the screen, I'm going to open up my fundamental chess openings book. And I'm going to flip to the contents, okay? And I'm just going to go through the list and I'm going to make a decision. So for this example, I'm going to choose, let's say I'm playing as black. So I'll flip the board here. I'm playing as black and I want to choose something against D4, right? Because I mean, I have to learn what to do against D4. I have to learn what to do against E4 and, and maybe some other things. But right now I'm going to start with, with learning this, this one. So what am I going to play against the move D4? So in my fundamental chess openings book, I'm going to go through and say, okay, Queen's Gambit declines, Slav, Semi-Slav. I'm going to pick one and turn to it. So for this example, I'm going to choose Benoni and Benko, okay, and go to page 140. And this is, just for the record, this is not an opening that I'm familiar with. I'm, I'm intentionally choosing an opening that I'm not familiar with, so that as I go through some of these examples, you can see the process, because I'm assuming that you're not going to know anything about the opening you're going to learn as well. So uh, I have never played the Benoni or the Benko before, but I think it's an opening I'm interested in. I'm going to check it out and see. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is make the opening move. So knight f6, c4, and c5. Okay, and I see that there's a diagram in the book, and it starts talking about it. And so, you know, the Benoni is closely related to the King's Indian, especially if black develops his bishop on g7, as he does in most Benoni variations. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to go through, I'm going to read all this, and I'm going to make an opinion on, do I like the way that sounds? Do I like some of the things that it was talking about? And I would do that on a couple different openings. I'm going to choose this one because I actually have been interested in the Benko for a while. I've never actually taken the time to learn it, but I, I would like to. And I read through it and I thought, oh, that sounds like something I, I'd be interested to, to learn about. So so I'm going to choose the Benko Gambit. Okay, so there we go. Step one is completed. I've chosen. I'm going to start to play the Benko as black uh, against D4. So now we move on to step two. But before I do that, suppose I didn't have this book, right? You didn't buy FCO, you don't have it, what do you do? An alternative would be to go to like chess.com. All right, so over here on chess.com, I would go to the opening explorer section and I would kind of scroll through the different openings and I would find one that interests me. And, and again, here is the Banco Gambit and I would click on it and look at some details in the opening explorer if you have it. If you don't have chess.com's opening explorer, I think you need the pre premium membership to go very deep with it. Um, you can do like Lee Chess has it as well, and you can kind of find some openings that way. Um, or you can just Google and, and Google different openings. It's more time consuming. That's why I like having the, the fundamental chess openings. But you can get by without it if, if you have enough time and determination. But eventually, you know, you have to get some details about different openings and make a decision. Okay, so going back, I've chosen the Benko. Let's move forward to step two. All right, so as a reminder, step two is learning the backbone of the opening. So the main line, the, the core behind the opening. So at this stage, you don't want to get bogged down in, in long and complex uh, lines. Okay, so if it's too long and complex, you're not doing it right. Okay, you're, you're just looking at the bare minimum right now. So D5, and I'm looking at the book, and it says the next move is B5. Okay, so I'm going to make the move on, on my board. And I'm just going to stop and consider the position for a second. All right. So what I'm noticing is it looks like I'm just giving away this pawn. Well, that makes sense, right? Because it's a gambit. And I knew that going into it. So I'm just going to flip through and look at the very main line. Okay. And so the main line for white is C takes B5. And it says, over the years, many attempts have been made to avoid this move and steer the game in a different direction, but without success. 
And then he kind of goes and talks through some of those variations. Now, at this point, remember, I'm not getting bogged down in all those variations. So it says, you know, knight f3 is probably the best of the alternatives, and he kind of talks about it. a4 has also been tried. I'm not going to waste my time even looking at those right now. Remember, just looking for a bare minimum, what is this opening all about? So I'm sticking to the main line. I want to go all the way through the main line just to see what we're talking about here. So after c takes b5, we play a6, and then b takes a6. Again, there's another option here. In this position, however, white does have some fully acceptable alternatives, refusing the gambit with b6. So he's saying, you know, you could go b, they could go b6 here, but I'm not even going to waste my time. I say waste my time. I'm not going to take time to do that right now. That's comes in step three later on. Right now, I'm just going through with the main line to see what happens. So, and by the way, for those of you who do have this book and are following along with me, you'll notice that the main line is kind of in the center of the columns of text, and then the variations are kind of off to the left. And so that's how you can keep track of where you are and not get confused by which move he's talking about. So if it's in the center, that's the main line. Um, that's just something that I know some people can get confused by that, but just try to focus on the center when you're doing the main line. And then we have bishop takes a6. And if you read the little blurb about it in the book, it talks about how, you know, the original idea of this gambit was instead of taking over here, it was playing e6 and kind of talks about some different ideas there. So that's something that I'm just making a mental note of like, oh, okay, e6 used to be played and now bishop a6. And again, I'm just trying to get familiar with the general idea behind this opening. So then he kind of talks about the position a little bit. Now, what does black have for his pawn? All right, so I'm going to read that, and I'm going to kind of get an understanding of what does black have for his pawn. Okay, and so I just read through that, and, you know, the standard plan is you're controlling this diagonal with your bishop. You're going to play, like, g6, bishop g7. After you castle, you're going to get this rook over here. You're going to have both rooks lined up on half open files. Maybe your queen's going to go uh, to one of these squares, and you get a lot of pressure over here on the queen side and it's it's positional in nature so as the game goes on you just have this kind of trade-off for that pawn and so that's what i learned from reading through that and so i'm kind of just making mental notes of like okay so this is the idea behind playing the banco gambit okay and then he goes on to talk about how there's two main lines for white in this position knight c3 and then e and e4 or to play the fianchetto variation with g3 and so, okay, knight c3 followed by e4. I might just look at a couple moves. So let's see what that's all about. Knight c3, g6, which was from the plan that we had kind of talked about earlier. And then white would play e4. And then we have bishop takes f1, king takes f1, d6, g3, bishop g7, king g2, castles, knight f3, and knight b to d7. And he says, this is the most important starting position in this main line. So standard plan of queen either here or here, and then bringing the rook over. And you can see black has both rooks lined up. This is pretty standard for the Banco game. So at this point, what I would do is go back to the very beginning and try to remember what I just learned. And if, if I can't remember it on the first time, I would look through those lines again until I can at least remember the main just basic line. So I'm going to try to do it. Let's see, d4 play knight f6, c4, c5, d5, and I play b5, and I'm sacrificing the pawn, he captures, and I remember, you know, trying to get my bishop on this diagonal, so I think the move was a6, takes, takes, and then, let's see, I want to say that it was knight c3 at this point, and like e4, and there was another option, g3, bishop g2, I think, so I'm going to move through, and I think we just kind of did some fianchetto, traded these off, and, and if you don't remember all this, just go back and look. It's not a big deal. Um, bishop g7. And like right now, I'm, I'm kind of forgetting. I want to say it was maybe g3. Don't remember, so I'm just going to go look. So yeah, g3, d6, king g2, castles, knight f3, and knight bd7. Okay. And so I would do that a couple more times until I, I felt comfortable that I had learned this one line. And the important takeaway here, guys, is that you learn the ideas behind the openings that you're playing. Like, try to remember the ideas as opposed to the exact moves. So in this Benko Gambit, the idea is I want to create pressure over here on the queen side, which means I'm going to be putting my rooks over there, lining up on these pawns, 
white has some weaknesses, you know, there's some holes that I can either maybe put my knights into or even on this d3 square, if I push this pawn, I could get a knight uh, in there. Those ideas are what I'm trying to remember. All right, so at this point, I would say we have completed step two. If somebody were to ask you, hey, what's the Benko Gambit about? You could tell them, well, the Benko Gambit is against d4, you play knight f6, and if they play c4, you play c5, d5, and then you play b5 and sacrifice your pawn. And the idea is that you're gonna, you know, play a6, get your bishop along this diagonal, and generate pressure on the queen side with your rooks and queen. That's the idea behind the Benko Gambit. So we have accomplished step number two. We, we have an idea of what to do. All right, now if you don't have the book, another way to do this would be to go to chess.com, go to the opening explorer, and if we click on the Benko Gambit, you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and flip the board here. So I'm looking at it from Black's perspective. You can see all these moves over here. C takes B5 is a move, F3 is a move, Queen C2 is a move. I would start with the top one. Okay, so C takes B5. Okay, this is the main line. And then I would go to the next one, uh, A6. Okay, and you can see how many people have played it. So you kind of know, you know, what to expect as far as the main line. And again, the same kind of idea as, as before, I'm just trying to get an idea. Now, interesting here, the main move is g6, and in the book, it was talking about um, bishop takes a6. So, you know, here, you'd have to, in step three, when we dive into some more details, you'd get, get to bishop a6 later, but it looks like g6 is another option, knight c3, and now bishop takes a6. So it transposes into the same, the same line anyway. So, we, yeah, we get the same position that we saw before, okay? D6, knight, of, knight F3, I think that was different. I think the other one was G3. Uh, but again, I'm just trying to get an idea of like, okay, what are the, the main moves that most people play? And if you look here at the top, these are master games. So you, you can know that the most common move played, if most of the masters are playing it, it's gonna be one of the better moves. It's not always the best move, but it's usually a pretty good move that a lot of people would agree is good to play and so if you don't have the book this is kind of the other option for how you would learn um what the what the lines are all right guys so now we're going to move on to step three and step three is when you really dive into more details okay and you do it in kind of iteration so the way that i would approach it is and i like to quiz myself as i do this so d4 knight of six c4 c5 d5 b5 captures and then I remember that there was two main lines after a6 takes and takes. I think we looked at the knight c3 and e4, but there was also another one, the fianchetto line. So I'm gonna grab the book and I'm gonna go look that one up. All right, so now I'm gonna go through the fianchetto variation. So g3, and I'm gonna read through what, what this is all about. Okay, and so it's saying that the main point of this is that white is trying to avoid trading off these bishops here. So, all right, let's see what happens. So d6, bishop g2 g6, knight to c3, bishop g7, knight f3, knight b to d7. All right, so at this point, we have two main lines that we've learned, right? So d4, knight f6, c4, c5, d5, b5, takes, a6, takes, takes. And then there was the knight c3 line where white plays e4 and we exchange the bishops. I would go through that one. And then there's the g3, bishop g2 line where white leaves the bishops on. They, he doesn't exchange them and I would go through that one. And then I would go back to the book and go through earlier, remember I skipped over some of those sub variations, I would go through those as well. All right, and once I've gone through those, then I'm gonna just practice with myself, okay? And this is important because a lot of people, I think they learn a new opening and they're like, all right, I'm gonna go play it in a game. And you know, they get into a game and what happens? Their opponent plays E4 and you're just like, Really? I just spent like five hours learning the Banco Gambit and my opponent plays E4. And so you play a game and then, you know, next game, what happens? You get white. Like, All right, I got to play a game with white. And then what happens? Next game uh, and your opponent plays like knight of three. And you're like, great. So when I'm, after I learn an opening, practice it by yourself. Okay, so pretend like you're playing a game and just make the move. D4. And like, okay, what am I playing against D4? Ah playing the Benko, let's do it, knight of six. What's my opponent gonna play? I think he plays c4, now what am I gonna play? Uh, let's see, oh yeah, c5. Do it yourself because this way you can get lots and lots of practice. Like if I spend an hour and I just 
keep going through these lines, I could probably go through these lines like, I don't know, 20, 30 times maybe in and out. Like I, I could do it a lot of times, right? That's the point. So that's the best way to practice because you can't just hop into a game and, and force your opponent to play these lines. So practice it yourself, go through uh, a six takes, 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 and until you get comfortable and you feel like you know the lines. All right, guys, well, that's pretty much it. I mean, that's the three-step process that I use when I'm learning a new opening. What I might do is play the Banco a couple times. It'll be new to me, and so I think that'll create some learning opportunities, and maybe I'll kind of record some of those games and then make another follow-up video where I talk about, okay, I played it. This is what happened. Now, how do I learn from my mistakes and, and build off that uh, initial knowledge? Now, one more thing I'll mention is you can see how this is such a time-consuming process because I just did one thing for d4 openings as black but really i gotta do it again against e4 like okay what am i gonna play now i gotta do it again when i'm white if i if i'm gonna play e4 my opponent's gonna play like the sicilian i gotta learn something and then if my opponent's gonna play e5 i gotta learn something so you can see how learning openings can be extremely time consuming um and there's not really an easy way around that the only tip that i would say is don't feel like you have to learn every single line super, super deep. Learn the basics, learn the main couple of moves, and you're gonna get really, really far with that. Like you don't need to learn every single variation and all the like 50 different options that there are. Like just learn the main ones and start playing it. Please let me know in the comments if I missed something, if this you know wasn't clear, if there's some gaps that I you know just didn't cover or, or whatever the case may be. Let me know because I, I want to continue to make follow-up videos that really uh, help you guys out as far as learning openings. I know it's a big topic, lots of questions about it, so please let me know uh, you know what I missed and what you want to see in future videos. But as always, thanks for watching. Um, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.